Well, good morning. It's good to be together with you here in God's house. And I trust that you are as encouraged by the worship and the fellowship of brothers and sisters in the Lord, shared faith as I am. I tell you what, uh, we sang a song today that really nailed it. It's um, Jesus is all we need. Uh, he's the reason we're here. We've come for one reason, to meet with him this morning. And, and uh, so that's, we don't need all the frills and all the different things. We just need an encounter with him that really alters the course of our, our, our lives because we see him for who he really is. So we're going to look at God's word in Malachi. We're going to be concluding this incredible book. It is a Christmas message. So we kind of want to just sum it all up and do a, an overview, a really our, our laser focus on the final two chapters, just a few verses that uh, are really the, the purpose and the intent of the book. And so let me just ask this question, and I want to get your observations. So, so, so far from what we studied, what's the, the purpose of Malachi? Yeah, Malachi means messenger. So he's speaking on the behalf of God. He's got a message for his people. And what is he communicating to those, the, the hearers of his day, and to the readers and hearers of the Holy Spirit today? So what is, what's the overall message of Malachi? Anybody? Okay, believe in God, all right? Be prepared, okay? What else? Having a healthy fear of God. Okay, I think well, they've been sharing over and over that the purpose of Malachi is to return to our first love and that we would, would show that love by giving God the best we have to offer. Not that we're trying to gain his approval, but we're just giving him what he, he deserves and what he demands as a holy and righteous God. So if we're to look at the purpose of Malachi, it really comes down to these, these final two chapters. And there's this laser focus to see and accept God's only remedy for sin and right relationship with him. That's the purpose of the book. It's pointing us to the coming Messiah who puts us in right relationship with God. So we fear God so that we can be in right relationship with, with him. We look at Jesus. We look at the coming Messiah with anticipation so that the moment will not pass us by. And unfortunately, for many of Jesus' day, what is it said of them? The moment passed them by. They didn't take to heart what was spoken in the verses we're considering today. And I think it's just important for us to take it to heart and not let the moment pass us by. Of God speaking to the hearts of his people, drawing us to himself to live in right relationship with him. You have to turn me down because I'm going to get excited. I, I talk loud when I get excited. I'm sorry. So there's this, this, this laser focus, and what Malachi is doing, what, what Dusty teached about two weeks ago, what Ryan talked about last week, it's, it's an answer to the question of evil in this world. Why do the evil prosper? What's the deal with all the wickedness that's in the land? And Malachi gives an incredible answer that we mustn't neglect or fail to see. He gives the answer to evil in this world. There's only one answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> I wake myself up on that one. Put in our faith, put in our trust in Jesus Christ. So many times people get led astray, focusing on the problem that they feel, fail to see the answer that's right before them. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever separated from him, dying in their sins, they would believe, and in believing, they'd have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This probably won't be the first time for this adjustment. So the book of Malachi provides a simple, and I want us to see this as an overview, a powerful imagery, an illustration of the gospel. And we mustn't fail to see that in its layout. Remember all the indictments? 24 questions, 12 on God, 12 by the people, this back and forth bantering. It's a reminder that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. There, there's none righteous. No, not even one, Romans tells us. Secondly, we're reminded that the wages of sin is death. Malachi 3.2 says this, who can endure the day of his coming? In light of the coming of the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who can stand in his presence? Can anybody stand before a righteous God on their own merit? 
No, no one can. That's the book of Malachi. That's what he's saying. Nobody can. Outside of Christ. And the answer to that question is the purpose of this book. That the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That those who look forward to, that those who believe in and receive Jesus Christ as the satisfaction, the propitiation for their sins, the atoning sacrifice, the only one that puts me in right standing with my heavenly Father, a holy God. They will live with Him forever. They will have eternal life. That's the gospel. Malachi 3.18 puts it this way. That's what will distinguish the righteous from the wicked. What is it? Believing and receiving Jesus Christ or rejecting Him. That's it. That's the distinguishing mark. Those who are in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. Between those who are forgiven and those who are condemned. The one who serves God and the one who does not serve God. So Malachi 3 and 4 direct our thoughts, our hope, and our faith with, with laser focus on Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. I can't think of a more appropriate Christmas message than that. That we would see the Savior behind it all. You see, they were to live, somebody said, for preparation. They were to live like the ten virgins, awaiting the coming of the Savior. And I want you to think about that for a moment. There were ten virgins. All of them were virgins. What does that mean? They all waited. They saved themselves for their, their Savior, for their husband. They kept themselves pure. They were a super excited about their wedding day. And they were elated about the prospects of living the rest of their life with their husband. Yet tragically, and here's the tragi- tragedy of the parable, only five were ready when the time came. Hear me. This is a message to religious people, people who want to be in right standing with God. They kept themselves pure. They did all the right things. But when the time came, the appearing of our Lord, they weren't ready. And only five were received by the, bride, by the groom. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what Malachi is all about. Don't miss the coming Savior. Don't miss God's provision. Don't miss God's call to return to him and the pathway for that return. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. With that, let's take a look at three things this morning from Malachi 3. We're just going to look at the first two verses of that chapter, and then we're going to look at chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Thank you. Oh, my son came to my rescue. I love it. (laughs) Sorry, guys. All right. So I, we're going to focus on three things. Number one is the force of fulfilled prophecy. Sometimes we don't like to look at it because it just seems so overwhelming. But we, it's given to us for a reason, and I want the full impact to be garnished in our hearts this morning. We're going to understand the, the special insight that Malachi gives us on the day of the Lord, the day of his appearing, how to, how to understand it properly and respond accordingly. And then to utilize the, the incredible gift that God has given us, the only resource to stay strong in our devotion to God. Let's start with the force of fulfilled prophecy. And, and we'll read Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. It says this, In answer to the dilemma of evil in this world, Behold, I am sending my Malachi messenger, and he will clear a pathway before me. And the Lord, whom you are seeking, will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight, the Malachi of the covenant, Jesus, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of armies. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? And let's go on now to chapter 4 
and Dusty did a great job talking about the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to focus today a little bit about the, the coming of John the Baptist and the prophecy that he fulfilled in leading us to Christ. Chapter 4, for behold, the day is coming, that, that same day of the Lord, and burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and, and every evildoer will be chaff. And notice how the evildoers are described. Arrogant. We know better than God. We don't answer to God. God answers to us. Right? Isn't that the, the heart of the, the people of Malachi's day? And they will be like chaff on that day that is coming, and it will set them ablaze. Boom, they're gone, says the Lord of armies. So that it will leave them neither root nor branches, but you. You who fear my name, which Ryan talked about last week, that fear of the Lord. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. Sun, S-U-N. The same sun that brings life to plants that are connected to the vine, but the same branches that are on the ground are withered by the sun. The same sun, same light. But he will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go forth and frolic like calves from the stall. And you will crush the wicked underfoot, for there will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I am preparing, says the Lord of armies. So remember the law of Moses. Keep the solemn. I keep it all in front of you. That's what we're here for today. That's why we, we, we study God's word on a weekly basis, collectively. We study, study it individually as disciples of Christ. The statutes and the ordinances which I commanded in Horeb for all of Israel. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, we read that, and it's just kind of flippantly. But this is for them to look forward to. The Messiah is not going to come without a forerunner. You're going to look for the forerunner first. He's going to be announcing the coming king. He's going to be playing the trumpet, and you'll know your Messiah has come. I'm sending him. Before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children. And the hearts of the children to their fathers. So that it will not come and strike the land. I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction. So let's take a look at four prophetic statements. That are each fulfilled in the life of John the Baptist. That sometimes we, I think we're all aware of. But we, we, we fail to think about or let it sink in. The first one from Malachi 3 is this, Behold, I send my messenger. John, we're told in the New Testament, was the least, or the, great, the last, not the least, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he was the greatest of the prophets, or the, those messengers, those Malachi's. And it was due to his association, his close association with Jesus and the role of helping others see Jesus more clearly for who he was. Why was he the greatest of the Old Testament prophets? Because he announced the coming of the king. This is the Messiah. He's right here. Matthew 11, 9 and 11, you can read that on your own. Secondly, we're told in Malachi 3 that he will clear a way before me. Is that true of John the Baptist? Absolutely. That's what he saw in himself. In fact, that's the one thing he was confident about, that he was here to make straight ways to the Lord or a straight path to the Lord. This is a flashing light to take note of prophetically and understand the weight and the significance of what's being put out there for us. It's Matthew 11.10 and here's what Jesus said of John the Baptist. This is the one who, of whom it is written, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, quoting Malachi, who will prepare a way before you. He's connecting the dots that he is the Christ, the Messiah. John was the one who went before him. Understand. Thirdly, he says, I'm going, to, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before co the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 5. And for John the apostle, who was a disciple, a very close disciple of John the Baptist before 
transferring his membership over to the ministry of Jesus. Not that he was forsaking John, but he went over to be a, a disciple of Jesus. And from him we learn that although John the Baptist didn't fully understand his place in God's plan, when asked who he was in John 1, 19 to 22, he, he said, I know that I'm not the Christ. Are you the Christ? No. He, he knew he wasn't the prophet. Now, we read that and we don't think anything of it, right? But he's saying that was what they were looking for, for the Messiah, in Deuteronomy 18, 12, that there is going to be a prophet who rises among your people like Moses. Here it is. They're, they're looking forward to this in anticipation. This is the Messiah. In fact, when Peter preached at Pentecost, remember his message. Let me share it with you a little bit. Acts 3. It says, at verse 17, And now, brothers... I know that you acted in ignorance in what you did to Jesus. You, you didn't understand who he was. Just as your rulers also did. But the things which God previously announced, here it is. The message was sent and you didn't recognize it. By the mouths of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled in this way. You thought you didn't understand it, but actually you are fulfilling what God said in your misunderstanding. The majesty of God. Therefore, now here it is. What's the response? Well, God used my disobedience. Praise the Lord. I'll just continue to be disobedient. No. Therefore, now that you're aware, repent. And return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of the restoration of all things, the things we're talking about here in Malachi, about which God spoke beforehand by the mouths of his holy prophets from ancient times. He says, Moses said this. Here he is. He's alluding to the prophet. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me and your countrymen. Interesting. Islam points this to Muhammad. And the, the words here matter. From among your countrymen, from the tribe of Israel. To him you shall listen regarding everything he says to you. And it shall be that every soul that does not listen to that prophet shall be utterly destroyed among the people. Was John that prophet? No. He was sent to be a witness of that prophet who was Jesus. He thought he wasn't Elijah. They asked, are you Elijah? He says, no, I'm not Elijah. I'm John the Baptist. Now, this was a misconception about himself that Jesus would later correct, clarifying his role in fulfilled prophecy. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14, 15. If you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. Flashing lights. He's the messenger. He's the one announcing my arrival. Give me my rightful place in your lives. And these, this is in response to those not accepting the deity of Jesus Christ, understanding his full, full nature and full disclosure. You see, John the Baptist and prophecy is designed to help us as the people of God connect the dots. That's why this is so important. And it's very important that we don't just gloss over it. Understand and accept the full force of fulfilled prophecy. It, it shaped and confirmed all that they had been waiting for in Christ. If you read the Gospels, what are they doing? They're asking questions. Who's the Messiah? Who's the Christ? Everything hinges on what they were looking for. And... They were ill-prepared, right? They, they saved themselves, but they weren't ready when the, when the Messiah came. All that John knew was, and here's what he was confident of, he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord, a direct fulfillment of God's word on his role in ministry. 
And then in chapter 4, Jesus, or Jesus, through the Holy, the Holy Spirit, says through Malachi, He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction. And again, we read that and, and, and don't give much time and thought to it, but I want us to consider that in light of Luke chapter 1, verses 13 to 17, and understanding the context of this, the heavenly activity taking place surrounding the birth of Christ. An angel, Gabriel, visits Zechariah, a priest, unable to have children, and, and he gives the following instructions. Here's the message he got from God through the angel. The angel of the Lord said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. Remember, they were old in age. They were unable to have children. Some of us know how uh, disconcerting that can be and how helpless we are to bring it to pass. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will name him John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. He's going to be a Nazarite. He's been dedicated to my service. Nazarite vow. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And I want us to hear that for a minute. So if John the Baptist wasn't filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb, this would be a false prophecy. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to their Lord, their God. And it is he, here's the, the, the words verbatim of Malachi chapter 4. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. How do we know? He will turn the hearts of the fathers back to their children, just like Malachi said. And, and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's the force of fulfilled prophecy. Now let's look at the point. What's the point of it all? The point is to recognize the fingerprint of God. It's to establish faith and trust in Him. A couple of points here. Number one, Jesus couldn't be the Messiah without a forerunner, without John the Baptist. This was outside of Jesus' control on an earthly level, right? I can't help who comes before me or comes after me outside of God's providence, God's sovereignty, God's hand. We don't do that. Only God can. That's the point. That's what God did because he can, and that's who he is. Once again, God was stacking the cards against him, right? Almost like... Elijah the prophet, you guys, okay, do everything you can to, 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 to gain the advantage and lighten the altar and dr drench mine with water. Days on end. You call upon your God, I'll call upon mine, and we'll see who starts the fire. And it wasn't an even playing field. He stacked the cards against God. Why? Show us his power that you would know beyond the shadow of a doubt this is the true God. Serve him, repent, love him. What's he doing with, with Jesus and John the Baptist? This is an act of God. Recognize it. Surrender to him and serve him. Secondly, these prophets, prophecies took place 400 years before John was born. Yet, Isaiah spoke about it as well. That's 700, over 700 years before John was born. Yet, he fit the bill perfectly. <laughs> John 1, 6-8. This is what John says of him. He, a man came from, uh, from God, or one who was sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to testify about the light. This was the true light that came into the world and enlightens every person. That's the purpose of it all. Lastly, I want us to take note of God's activity and bringing his word into fulfillment. That's the majesty of Christmas. And here's my fear. Is all the surroundings of Christmas. 
The purpose of every Christmas light, every Christmas tree, every Santa suit, I don't care. It, it all points to Jesus. That's the purpose of it all. And if it fails to do so, we've missed the point. Every angelic story, every song isn't a song to sing. It's to put Jesus right in front of us and give him his rightful place. Notice what took place in Luke chapter 1. Let me remind us of the story a little bit. John's parents and Jesus' earthly parents would be Joseph and Mary. We're all part of the righteous few. Man. Remember Malachi chapter 2 when he talked about the uh, husbands forsaking the wives of their youth and, and really violating the nuclear family? Our culture today. And what does it say? He says, but there's a righteous few. The, those righteous few, the remnant of the Spirit will not act this way. The Holy Spirit will not let them violate the commitment to their family. That for a man of God, his testimony of faith in Jesus Christ is how he treats his wife and his kids, first and foremost. That a woman of God, her, her virtue and her, her commitment to, to the Lord is seen in how she treats her husband and her kids. <laughs> I'm just going to hold this bad boy. All right. So, so, so there's these righteous few. And now Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, and Joseph, they're all part of the righteous few who give God his rightful place and serve him. And that makes them instruments of God, makes them pliable, available to him. Secondly, Zechariah and Elizabeth, who had desperately been doing everything they could to have a child to no avail until the Lord visited them and mercifully and miraculously opened her womb and allowed her to be pregnant with John. Sorry. <laughs> and Mary, the mother of Jesus, who had no relations sexually with a man, was impregnated with Jesus. And just as miraculously, Joseph didn't put her away. Think about that, guys. Honey, I know we're engaged. I had an incredible dream, and I'm pregnant. And it's God's son. Really? I, I don't think so. How could you do this to me? I could put you on blast, I, but putting you on blast, put me on blast. Let's just let's deal, deal with this quietly. I'm done. Until divine intervention. Joseph, she's telling the truth. What? She's telling the truth. In fact, she's going to have a son, and he's, you're going to name him Jesus because he's going to save the people from their sins. And so impacted were each of these individuals by these divine experiences that they believed, and they made themselves available to God. Incredible testimony of divine activity. God bringing these events to, to pass for what reason? So that people would recognize his fingerprints in it all. All four, Mary, Joseph, Zechariah, and Elizabeth, were all visited by angels. 400 years of, of silence. And, and don't confuse silence with inactivity. God was working from, from Malachi's day, from Zechariah's day, all the way to Jesus' day in preparing the world for the coming of the Messiah. So we, we make a mistake thinking God was silent, not doing anything. He was speaking, just not inspirationally, until the coming of our Lord. So all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, or, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. John, while he was still in his mother's womb, right, fulfilling prophecy. Why? To confirm their belief and their trust in God. 
Don't doubt God. I mean, what does that even look like? Mary comes over six months after Elizabeth has been pregnant. She walks through the door, and what? John's in her belly, starts speaking in tongues, or starts raising his hand like, hallelujah, you know, whoa, I'm full of the Holy Spirit right now. <laughs> I mean, how, what happened? I don't know what a child in the womb looks like that's full of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but that's what happened. And here's the point. Don't limit God. Just because we can't explain it, we can't understand it, doesn't mean it didn't happen. John was full of the Holy Spirit while still in the mother's womb. Hallelujah. We should be thanking God and prepared to fulfill his, his purpose and his call in this world. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and would speak prophetically under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah, you can read it for yourselves, chapter 1, verses 67 to 79. Elizabeth, in chapter 1, verse 42 to 45. Mary, in, chap in verse 35 and 46 to 55. They're all speaking under the unction of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, even in, in Matthew chapter 1, it's, it's all tributing or contributing to our understanding of God. This is God's plan, God's man. Believe, believe, believe. What Luke was getting at and the picture he was betraying was how closely related the birth of John was with Jesus. Tying them together. Why? Focusing on all the divine activity taking place for one reason, to bring into fulfillment everything God had promised so that we would believe. That's it. That we would see Jesus Christ for who he really is, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. That's the Christmas story. So let's take a look at now at some of the insights Malachi gives on this day of the Lord. I think it's very important. And these are things that Jesus taught us about the kingdom of God that are sometimes difficult to understand because there's a dual nature to them. So there's a now aspect to God's kingdom and God's promises, and there's a future aspect to God's promises and God's kingdom. And that's what's brought about in Malachi. That's what Jesus talked about, and it's important for us to understand. So let's take a, look, a closer look at that this morning. So let's look at starting with the now aspect of God's kingdom. Here's what Malachi was saying in chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. The moment we accept Jesus and his covering for our sins, God's provision for the sinfulness of man, our sins are forgiven. He's the refiner's fire. He's the launderer's soap. He makes us white as smoke. No, he removes our sins as far as the east from the west. Our sins are completely forgiven. Our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. Malachi chapter 3. But for those who feared the Lord, the, the righteous few, not everybody did. But those who feared the Lord accepted God's word. A book of remembrance was made with their names in it. Their names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. Same thing in Revelation 21-27. The moment we accept Christ, we are secure in him. Malachi chapter 3, he, he rebukes the devourer for them. John tells us, no one's able to snatch us out of the Father's hand. Hallelujah. All the perks of heaven, of eternal life, are ours. The moment we accept Jesus Christ. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. He will fulfill their God-given dreams so that I will not come and strike the land with complete destruction. Here's the point. For the believer, the day of the Lord is a great and glorious day. It's the day we've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. From the domain of this world to the do domain of God. I no longer belong to myself. I belong to God. I no longer belong to the enemy of this world. I belong to God. That's ours in Christ Jesus. It's a great and glorious day. Look forward to it and surrender to it. Let's look at the perks of God's kingdom. Let me ask, what are some of the perks of God's kingdom that we have as believers in Jesus Christ? Eternal life. Not just quantity of life, 
That's quality of life as well. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You don't need anybody to teach you. The Holy Spirit's in us. He teaches us all things. The, the greatest preachers in the room today. And that's the Holy Spirit. Bringing his word to life in our everyday experience. Hallelujah. I trust him, otherwise I'd never be up here. What else? What are some of the perks we have as, as believers, as those who put their trust in Jesus? Salvation. Salvation. Hallelujah. No more pain. Right? Nobody wants to die, but everybody wants to go to heaven. <laughs> okay, but folks, in heaven, it's all done away. Right? There will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more effects of sin in this world. It will be taken care of. Evil will be taken away, be care of through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. We have tons to celebrate. Let me mention six things Malachi tells us are ours, perks for believing in the Messiah. They're nestled in God's undying and unchanging love. I have loved you, and I've loved you with a love that will not change. That's Malachi 1, 2 and Malachi 3, 6. They were pardoned, completely forgiven and restored in right relationship with God. Malachi 3, 3 to 4. Dusty talked about that a couple weeks ago. Ryan reemphasized it last week. They were refined as fire. And I want us to understand the, the purpose of the imagery here. As they refine the fire, they say that silver re, it's, it's refined when, when the image of the refiner is clearly reflected by the, by the material. So as the image of Christ is born in our lives through his refining work, making us more like Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. Softened to the things of God. Sensitive to the heart of God. Able to be shaped and used for the refiner's purpose. Purified. Continually cleansed and purged from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Mm, thank you, Lord. Fourthly, they found their ultimate healing. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. 1 Corinthians 15. The day is coming when the perishable will put on unperishable. This corruption will put on incorruption. And until and when that happens, that's when death is swallowed up in ultimate victory. Thank you. We have all the comfort, all the peace, all the hope, all the joy we will ever need in Christ. And notice how these are all predominant themes of the advent, the coming of Christ. Fifthly, they'll have the ultimate joy. They're going to go forth and frolic like calves from the stall. They're going to they're going to dance, bullseye, <laughs> Un, unshackled. I can't wait for that day. I'm so reserved. If I'm dancing, I'm thinking, like, who's watching me right now? Why do I have no rhythm? I ain't got rhythm. You know? it's like, God help me to get some rhythm. You know, what is going on here? I like to dance vicariously through my wife. I'm like, I'll sit down. Go ahead. You know, you know you do your thing. I, but I, the day is going to come when we're unshackled. We're going to dance like David danced. And nobody's going to care. It's just going to be sheer joy. <laughs> oh, it'll be good. man! What a, what a day that will be. The greatest joys we ever experience on earth will be exponentially greater in heaven. That's what we have to look forward to. As believers, we have joy unspeakable and full of glory. But the flip side of this is true as well. And I... I that's the point of Malachi. We can't just focus on the benefits in Christ. We also need to understand the tragedy of rejecting Christ. And that's what he nails so well. You see, the, the worst sorrows we'll ever experience on earth will pale in comparison to the sorrows and torment of hell. It's not worth walking away from God. It's not worth tuning out a deaf ear. It's not worth rejecting the counsel of our Lord. It reminds me of the rich young ruler. I'm st what am I still lacking? Jesus says you're lacking one thing. Go and sell all that you have and follow me. We know the story, what happened. 
It says the man went away sorrowful or sad because he had a lot. He wasn't willing to give up. I often picture Jesus not just saying, you know what, sell all you have and follow me. I knew you didn't have it in you. Get out of here. Not, no, that's not the Lord. I often hear Jesus saying, go sell all that you have and follow me. Oh, I got a lot. Do it. Dude, it's worth it. Get rid of these things that don't matter. These golden handcuffs. Man, they're just tying you to the world. Let them go. Follow me. It's the only pathway to life. And he went away sad. His heart was not the only one that was broken that day. I can see the tears in the eyes of our Lord. As this man missed out on the incredible life God had purchased for those who put their hope and trust in him. Lastly, they had the final victory. Verse 3, you'll crush the wicked one under your, under your feet. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet, just like Satan is crushed under the heel of Jesus' feet. The only way, the only way to overcome evil in this world, so we hear this question all the time, we want to try to come up with these fancy answers. Listen, the only way to overcome evil in this world is to get a clear picture of who Jesus Christ is. He is the answer to the sinfulness and brokenness of man. He's the only answer. The only way to overcome evil in this world is by giving Jesus his proper place in our lives personally, collectively, and nationally for that matter. Now let's look at the yet-to-come aspect, right? So the, for the believer, the coming of the Lord is a great and glorious day. The moment we accept Christ, we have all the, the blessings of heaven that are ours. But there's also the yet-to-come aspect. Chapter 4, verse 1. The day is coming burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day is coming that will set them ablaze. For those who don't know the Lord, the day of the Lord, those who reject Christ and his coming, it will be a dreadful day. It'll be a day to fear. And understand, so the message that the unbeliever is, get right. There's hell to pay outside of Christ. The message of the believer is, all your sins are forgiven. Let go of the shame. Let go of the things that are holding you back. It'll be, a, Malachi calls this a great and terrible day where they will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, sinners in the hands of an angry God or a holy God. And that message has led many to a life of repentance and turning to the Lord. That's the purpose of it. Secondly, it'll be a destructive day, burning like a furnace. This, this word burning like a furnace is found one other time in the scripture. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? We're not going to bow. And if God saves us, great. If he doesn't, we're still not bowing. We're his. And the king got upset. What did he do? He turned the fire up seven times. The furnace so hot, it was a place of punishment. And so they bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shackled. They throw them in the fire. What happens to those that are throwing them in the fire? They fall over dead because it's so hot. Fire's hot, man. I got this. Face to prove it. <laughs> I got the feelings, man. Okay, it's hot. Just getting close without getting burned. And so they fell over and died. Whoa. And they're like, what's going on inside the furnace? Why does it look like there's three people dancing in there and another person with them? Like the Son of Man. Here's an incredible picture of what we have here in Malachi even. God's so, so awesome with what he gives us. This place of punishment. Intent on killing. The way to sin is death. But in Christ, we're protected. We escape God's wrath. And that's exactly what took place for them. So everybody in Christ, we're good. Everybody outside of Christ, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Fourthly, thirdly, excuse me, it'll be a devastating day. He goes on to say all the arrogant, those who raise their fist at God, Thumb their nose at him. Remember what he said in Malachi 3.13, your words have been arrogant against me. Who are you to question God? Who are we to question God? Every evildoer will be chaff on that day and, and they will be set ablaze. 
this is no doubt the final judgment. This didn't happen when Jesus first came, right? We have salvation through him. The final aspect of God's kingdom comes at the final day of judgment before the judgment seat of Christ. For all those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, for every name that's not written in the book of remembrance. No wonder Malachi says, who can stand when he appears? And these are things we need to think about and consider deeply because outside of Christ and outside of God's provision, it truly is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And we need to take that to heart and convey that to those around us. Repent. Repent. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So it's fitting that the Old Testament concludes with the anticipation and this focus on the day of the Lord. It's a demanding day. In other words, it's a day that demands a response. God, through his messenger Malachi, makes a final appeal to be ready when that day comes. Don't let this moment pass us by. And here's the point of the passage and the point of Christmas. Because the coming of the Lord will be like a thief in the night. When, when we least expect it, be prepared. How are we to be prepared? Continually walking in the Spirit. Continually being fed by the Word of God. Strengthening the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So finally, we have the resource for staying true to God or staying strong. And that is God's Word. He says now, in light of the return of the Lord, remember the law of Moses. Keep these things in your heart. Treasure these in your mind. And two things, and, and as, as I close. What's the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is to reveal Christ. That's it. Let's see how Jesus explained it in John 5, 33 to 40. I believe it's on the screen. Jesus says from the testimony of John the Baptist, we are foretold of his coming. He says, you sent to John... And he was born to witness the truth. And not that the testimony that I receive is from man. I don't, I don't really need John, but I gave it to you so you would believe. But I say these things so that you may be saved. Heed the call. Search the scriptures. They testify of me. Let it build confidence in your faith. He was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light, but you received to re you failed to receive the true light of Jesus. Secondly, he focuses on the testimony of his works, his sinless life, his authoritative teaching, his undeniable miracles. When raising Lazarus, he said, if you, if you believe for another reason, believe by what you see. Look what he says in John, in John 5. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. You not only have what I prophesied about him, you also have my life and my works and my teaching. And you think that in them you have, or excuse me, for the, for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works I'm doing bear witness about me that I am, I am. That the Father who sent me himself bore witness about me. His voice you have heard, his form you have never seen, and you did not have his word abide in your heart. You didn't remember the word of the Lord. You didn't let it be treasured in your heart and your mind. For you did not believe. And the one who was in, you didn't connect the dots. Thirdly, he mentions the witness of the scriptures. He says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. You refuse to come to me that you may have life. And it's, it's critical for us to interpret the scripture correctly, to understand the cohesion of the Bible. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. I think Dusty shared this a few months ago. Maybe it was in Zechariah. But, um, and the, the, New Te the Old Testament, or is the is New Testament concealed? The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. It's all pointing to God, revealing himself to man for one purpose, to draw us into a personal, intimate relationship with him. That's it. In him we live and move and have our being. Lastly, 
And I close with this. I got one minute. That's why it's so imperative that we study God's word. We study to learn. We learn to apply. We apply to grow. And we grow to teach. We cannot short circuit that process. We're lifelong students of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Of our Heavenly Father, working tirelessly through the Holy Spirit to forge the image of His Spirit, of His presence, of His character in our lives that we would bear the mark of his lordship. That's life for the believer. So we study to learn. We learn to apply. We apply to grow and we grow to teach. And notice who our text says the Bible's for. Who is it for? He says all of Israel. All of us. All of us. For all God's children. Each of us have a personal responsibility to grow in our understanding application and transmitting the truths of God. Don't let somebody else do it for you. I think that's the failure of, of the church of my generation. We leaned on the preachers and the pastors. Listen, it's our responsibility to search the scriptures. It's our responsibility to understand, understand the scriptures. It's our responsibility to be hearers of the word of God. And as hearers, faithful doers. Because God's word is the lifeline for keeping our walks with God strong and fruitful. It keeps us sensitive and dependent on the intent of the author who resides in the heart of every believer, the Holy Spirit. And I want us to remember, each of us at all times has direct access to the insight of the Holy Spirit. We all have it. All we got to do is ask. God uses people. People are, are wonderful tools that God uses to, to draw others to himself. But the agent, the, the, the mechanism that works is the Holy Spirit drawing people to himself through people. Listen to him. It's not enough to know what God says, what God's word says. The Bible says rightly divide the word of truth. Not just say what it says. Understand why he said it. What's the purpose behind it? What is he communicating about himself? What is he, what is he re want, wanting to respond from us, get from us, or get out of us for his glory? The Holy Spirit is always the best preacher. The Holy Spirit is always the best counselor. The Holy Spirit is always the best confronter, the best comforter, the best resource to make the most of all that God has given us. We have not because we ask not. We seek not. We fail to knock. Involve the Holy Spirit in all aspects of growing up in Christ. That's the reason we have Christmas. It's to be everything God has called us to be through Jesus Christ our Lord and the gift of his indwelling spirit. Luke 11, 11 to 13 if an earthly father, if a son asks for fish, is he going to give him a serpent or bread or a stone? How much more? If, if, if earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to their children, dad care, dads care about what their kids get. Yesterday we did a gift, gift exchange, was it, or Friday night it was a gift exchange, excuse me. And one of the, the youngest person that was here, little Joshy, he had a little plushie. And now he's holding that plushie, and he's loving it. I got this. And not understanding the game, anybody can steal it. And Jeremy's there, and Jeremy's like, I'm not playing this game because I don't like, I don't, people steal something, I want to steal it right back. You know, I'll, I'll beat that back out of you, you know. <laughs> and so he's sitting there, and his, his little son, his youngest one there, or some guy comes up, I like that plushie, let me have that one. He's like, no, he didn't. <laughs> if, if earthly fathers know how to take care of their children, Papa Bear comes out. Mama Bear comes out. Mama Bear came out too. She's like, oh, he don't like that one? He likes that one right there. Let me get that. Oh, hey, this is, you got a new toy. You're going to love this. Oh, it's all good. He's happy. He's happy. Listen, because they care. If we know how to care for our kids, God cares so much more for us. Oh, Lord, help us to see, see ourselves the way you see us. Oh, man. It'll transform our lives. Trans it, it changes everything. And what's it, what does he say? If you know how to give gifts, gifts to your children, how much more will the, the Father give the Holy Spirit to you? 
God's not withholding the spirit from us. We have what we need. We need God. I, I, I can't do it. He's like, I know you can't. That's why I gave you the Holy Spirit. Come on now. Lean on him. Listen to him. He's all you need. You have everything you need for life and godliness in the Holy Spirit with us. You don't got to do certain things to get it. Walk with him. Listen to him. Rejoice in him. And let's be everything God designed us to be for the glory of God and the goodness of man. Take away today. Because God has welcomed us into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. And in order to fulfill our God-given purpose as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, we will express God's grace in a broken world. What a privilege we have. Lord, I just ask now that you would possess us, that, that we would be possessed by you, that what, what motivates your heart more and more is what motivates our heart, that we would be extensions of gr grace in this broken world, that we would share your love, we would extend your peace, reflect your hope, and be a voice of truth in a world of chaos. Lord, and that we would speak not only the words of truth, but we would share it with the heart of our Heavenly Father, not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. We lay down our agenda, Lord. We lay aside our way of doing things, and we pick up the mantle of your humility, the, ma the mantle of your meekness, the mantle of your your grace and mercy and unconditional love. And Lord, help us everywhere we go to understand that you are with us. And because of that, we can and we must do everything you beckon us to do. And Lord, that all that we say, all that we do, would all be done for one reason, to bring you glory and to bring you honor. That we would take up the mantle of the forerunner, John the Baptist, and say, you must increase, and I must decrease. Father, grant this we ask in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And all God's people said, amen, and amen, and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. Look forward to seeing you tonight. Merry Christmas. May the best of our Lord be yours.